down. So, my name is Maximo Rouillet. So, you can just call me Massimo. It helps a little bit. Um, so, we're talking today about the serverless revolution with Azure Functions on .NET Core. So, those are the uh, slides that were provided to me. And those are my slides. They're a little bit funnier. Um, I'm a cloud developer advocate at Microsoft. And let's get in the depth of the subject right away. Before, we're talking about not too long ago, we used to build software directly in our own uh, data center, in our own companies. Maybe you had this room where it was a huge rack of servers everywhere. It was noisy. It was very cool. So during the summer, perfect place to hang out. Um, however, uh, all of this generated a lot of questions. Among those questions were, what size of server should I buy? How do I scale my applications? Do I have enough servers? I mean, and how, how, are, you monitor, are you monitoring them? Are you making sure that what works on them is actually working and it's not just a server with a green light on? Is my app running because the server says it's running, or is it, is it actually running? Are my servers secure? Could somebody just pick my server and go out with them? Are they locked? All of those questions are a question you, you have to ask yourself if you're in a relatively small company. But you're still a software developer. That's not the kind of question you want to be asking yourself. You're not focusing on your business. You're not focusing on bringing value to your company. So at some point during the past 10 years, we were told that you, know, you should not develop your, your application directly on bare bone machines. You should build them on virtual machines. So then you don't have the same questions about, well, do I need to buy more racks? The answer to that is no, just buy just one big one or multiple big ones, and then you just create more VMs. So as you want more software or you want more servers, you just create a new VM. But there's still a lot of those questions that remains. How big size of servers you need to run to have all those VMs hosted on them? And then you have a question that I have this massive monster of a machine. How much of it am I using? Do I need a server that big? And how do I scale my application on those servers? If I create multiple VMs on the same server, am I really scaling my application or am I just using more of the same server? And you still have all those questions about patching. How many of you actually has to still do Windows patch and Windows updates, or are still afraid of Tuesday patch, or things like that. Yeah, that, that, that's awesome, by the way. Um, and you still have all those questions about backups, because even though it's still a VM, it's still just a computer. And we've replicated that in the cloud, too. You can build all your software in a VM, and that is very fine, and there's no problem there. But it makes so much more questions that you, as a developer, have to ask yourself that really you shouldn't. You shouldn't have those questions. And then we move to more of a platform as a service. This is better known in .NET or in Azure as app services or um, other platforms, other cloud providers also offer their own version of, of PaaS. Now you have way less questions to ask yourself. There's no what size of servers you have to ask yourself, but we still ask you to pick a tier. How big do you want that server to be? How much are you ready to reserve so that we can guarantee that you have the same performance for your applications? So a lot of those questions now is how big do you want it 
and how many of them do you want? Those are the only questions you have, you have to ask yourself as a developer. But I believe this is like still way too much questions. Two questions, too, too, too many. Let's just build apps. That's the fun part. That's the fun part of the job. How many of you like to manage servers? I don't see many raised hands here. Ah, oh, there's one here in the front. <laughs> it's only because I can only see the front row with those big lights. So what if I can tell you that you can build software without caring about any servers? The only question that, is remain, that remains is, how do I architect my application so that I don't even have to think about servers? The only thing I have to care about is my code. So this is serverless. It's the platform for next-gen apps. And we have to remind you, of course, that serverless does not mean that there's no servers. Nobody believes that anymore. Um, it's all about not caring about how many servers I have. It is not caring about the scalability of your applications and letting a cloud provider handle the scalability issue for you so you don't have to think about all of those. Patching, we take care of it. Scaling, no problems. So it's all about the abstraction of servers. And we also have to think about a more event-driven type of ap applications. Well, a lot of our applications respond to events. They might not sound like events right now, but if you think about it, even if you build web applications, the first thing that somebody is going to do is go to your homepage. Wake up in the morning, open Google, homepage of your application, because it's the first thing they do, right? So when they hit the homepage, there's an event that is happening. And it's an HTTP request. That's a trigger. That will launch your application. And everything else is just events. So whether you're posting images, whether you're getting uh, HTTP requests, or something else is happening in your cloud, those are all events. And we have to react to those. And with serverless, it's so much easier to do those kind of events. And there's also the big problem of cost. How many of you are paying hundreds of dollars right now in computing, uh, computing resources? If you're not raising your hands, you're just lying to me. <laughs> okay, because most people will be spending a lot of money on either their own data center. So you will be spending money on licenses. You will be spending money on OS. Uh, you will be spending money on electricity on actual servers. And if, even if you're in the cloud, if you're using app service, you're going to be spending, at a minimum, $10 per month for this. But you could be spending as much as hundreds of thousands of dollars on multiple applications. So I have this scenario. Uh, anybody know Troy Hunt? Yeah? Security researcher? He, um, he has this application that says, um, it just got the bill for Azure function, which drive the Pwn password at API. This is an API that he offers everyone so that you can just type in your email address and know if a third party providers has been hacked and somebody has your email and probably your hashed password. The service is called Have I Been Pwned? And he says because 80% of this request are served from a, a, a cache, you only consumed 43,000 gigabytes per second of execution time on Azure. If you see the little screenshot over here, and especially the other guy's answer here, Mirjin, he says, it's free? And his answer was like, just this. Yeah, deal with it. It is free. That's what I call by microbailing. And by the way, I got a probation by Troy to use that. So you can do more with serverless. Whether you're talking about your DevOps productivity, where you have some scenarios that you want to handle, there's uh, data cleaning you want to do, 
all of this allows you to focus on your business logic. You stop caring about the infrastructure. You stop caring about, will I have enough servers? Or will I have enough electricity to run this? Or how much, am I go how much is it going to cost me? You just focus on your app and make sure that you can deliver awesome application. And with that, it also means you're going to have a faster time to market. People that have to handle cost and handle buying new server licenses are months behind. Because by the time the server arrives, your application may already be ready for market, or you might need more servers to run it. So that, now that we've gone over serverless, let me talk about Azure Functions. This is the serverless implementation by Microsoft. And this is basically just a merge of two logos, which is awesome. And it allows you to do many different ways of doing serverless. You can either do your binding through your code and, or tr through a function.json. So you can either define it or you can do it in your code. Here, we have a simple example where the binding is um, directly in function.json and not in your code. You can do both. So you, you can see here that we have a connections where our storage account will be linked, and then we have the type of the function will be linked to uh, the HTTP trigger. Uh, the parameters are going to be mapped directly in here. Same thing here for uh, the input table is going to be linked. And let's not do this. Let's do first function. And this is the reaction I'm hoping that we can, we can get all together. It's like, this is going to be awesome. So let's create our first function together. So is, is everything clean here and clear in the back? Is everything OK? All right. So if it's too small, scream at me. I will zoom in. So the first thing we can do here is we can just create a new, uh, new resources. All right, let's do this. Is that good? Oh, it's still this. Ah, oh, come on. Come on, kitty cat. Let's cancel it and go back here. Okay, let me just duplicate. That better? Awesome. Let's just resize the settings because there we go. And now we're back. Awesome. So let's just de unzoom a little bit. And the first thing we're going to do is cr click a little plus here. We want to create a resource. So we can just type in function and say function app. This is what we're going to be creating. Uh, and we click on the button at the bottom here, create. So the first thing we can do is type in a name. So let's do .NET 2018 func. There you go. Nobody used that. Nobody created it, please. So we could go uh, full on Windows. We can go Linux. This is still in preview, so we're not going to be using that for this demo. Uh, or we could go Docker. This is a new, uh, this is a new Microsoft. This is, we're not just doing Windows anymore. We're doing a whole bunch of different stuff. And here, we're going to be picking a, a hosting plan. So I talked to you about microbilling, and this was on a consumption plan. You basically tell us, handle it. We will take care of making sure that we only bill you what you actually use. But you could also go and say, I want to be using the same app service plan already, I'm, I'm already paying for. I don't want to be paying for extra things. So you can al already reuse um, hosting plan over here. So we're going to be picking West Europe because I think it's the closest one to us. West Europe right here. And we're going to be using an existing storage account that I already created, which is .NET 2018. And I'm going to turn off application insights for now. 
So this is going to create my first application. And the first function app that we're going to be creating is going to be super easy. It's going to respond to HTTP request. So let's take it here. Am I crazy or am I not seeing it? Deployment in progress. Please wait. So how was your day? <laughs> yeah. So it might just be the wireless. Let's try it out. All right. Then in 2018 funk. So this will create your, 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 the base application that will allow you to create your functions. You have to see the, the Funk app as an application and then individual functions. Uh, it would be just like declaring a class and you're having functions under it that will do one specific thing. So here, if we're looking at the menu, let me just unzoom a little bit. Um, we can create a different kind of, uh, of functions. So we could go webhook, an API, or we can go full timer or even do data processing. So we're going to start with a simple webhook API because this is going to allow us to, to write directly some code. And now we allow you also to pick your language. You can go through C Sharp, JavaScript, F Sharp, and Java. And there's also even more languages that we support. Most of them are in uh, experimental mode. So if you're interested about this, come see me after the talk. We'll talk more about that. So we're going to create this function, which is just a webhook API. And here you go. That's the first function we're going, to, we're going to be running. So we can just do run. I'm just going to rescreen this. All right. So Function executed uh, successfully. Why am I getting this weird? All right, you know what? Firefox never let me down. So this question here is, we're going to get an HTTP trigger on it. So what we can do is we can click on integrate. And I'm going to be zooming in for, for a little bit here. Um, what we see here is that we have an HTTP trigger. We can actually see the whole flow. You have a trigger that will have a request coming in. And you're going to have that output, which is going to be an HTTP. You can have multiple, in, multiple output here. So if I'm not happy with just returning a result, I could actually send a result of this, uh, uh, the response that I would be re uh, creating from this HTTP request to some other place. So do I want to send an email? Do I want to queue something? Or do I want to send an SMS to someone? There's many things that we can do with Azure Functions that allows you to integrate um, with your application in different ways. So let's go back to integrate. And here, by default, we will be um, only responding to selected methods. So the configured method we have here is get and post, but we can respond to all of them or just a few of them without any problems. So let's take this and look at the code. We can see here that we have our EQ, which is our, just our basic request. And if we run it here, and it's going to be on the left. I don't want you here. And we can test it out. So we're going to post a name here, Azure, and we're going to say run. And we're going to have Hello, Hello Azure. So let's do .NET 2018. And we have Hello .NET 2018. And all of this right now is hosted for free. It doesn't cost you a penny. This is totally, totally free. You don't need a credit card to run that. So let's go back to our awesome slides. 
I love that cat, by the way. It's awesome. Two more seconds. Okay, we're good. So, all the secret sauce for the Azure functions are linked on those elements. We're going to be talking about triggers and bindings. A trigger is what will cause your function to execute. We have blob storage. We have Cosmos DB. We have Event Hub. We have HTTP, queue, service bus, timer, and webhook. I can read a list. But if you want to know more, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We have a ton more at that link over there. Um, you will get the slides, by the way, and this is case sensitive. So whatever happens on the blob storage, let's say I upload a file. I want to have something happen to that file. I want to analyze that file. I want to uh, see how big it is, or I want to know what's happening on that file before shooting it off to somebody else. Well, and it, you can actually cr create a trigger for an Azure Functions that will launch every time you create a new file. Or what happens if a file gets deleted? That's also supported. One of the functions that can be used for Azure Functions are, among other things, event hubs and IoT hub by, uh, by extension. So I want to talk about scenarios. Because we're talking about all the triggers, all the bindings, and everything else, and it's fun, but what is it to you? How can you use it? So let's say we have a timer that every 15 minutes we want to run something. It doesn't have to be 15. That's comfortable. Maybe you have this huge amount of data in your database, and you want to be able to run a cleanup script. You want to be able to take that script and clean up the rows that you're not using, or maybe you're deleting rows, but you want to delete those rows every 24 hours so that you're not cleaning or deleting rows that people might do a undo on it. So this will clean up your table. So let's say that you have a client that will send you a CSV file. CSV, if you don't know, is like the facts of the IT world. It will just not die. It's something that people are still using today. It's just a separate file that has columns inside of it separated by a single character. But the thing is, it will ship you a whole file, but really what you're interested in is rows, because all of those represent a table. So maybe you have an Azure Functions that will read off this blob storage and split that table into different rows and put it in a table so that then you can analyze those tables through Power BI or any other scenarios. Another one might be taking a photo and having an application that will respond to a webhook on your application. Maybe that's not your application. Maybe it's some, somebody else's application. So th th in this case, somebody uploaded a picture to an application, and you're just, you want to be able to respond to that. So you go on that application, and you tell, me, you tell them, every time somebody uploads a picture from, for, uh, f uh, on, your, on your platform, I want you to call that, that URL. But the thing is, how many times are they going to call you? You don't know that. You don't know if they're going to call you once, three times, or a thousand times, or maybe a million times in an hour, in a minute. You don't know. But how do you ensure that you're going to be able to support all of that all the time without actually caring about the server, the scaling, and all those questions we want to get rid of? Azure Function can take all of this and put it into storage. We can respond to webhook, and we're going to be able to scale those kind of requests from external servers directly and be able to do whatever you want with them. So once you have those pictures, maybe you want to generate different size of them. Ever been to Amazon? Yeah. Um, they don't serve you a 10 megabyte picture. They serve you different sizes. So they have the original master images at 50 meg or whatever it is, and you're going to make variation of that image. Maybe it's something you want to do, and that's something that Azure Functions can help, help out with. And then,
maybe something you want to integrate your, with your application. Let's say you're building a web application that don't really need to be completely dynamic. Maybe you have a blog, or maybe you're, you're an ad provider and you want to be able to inject ads into a, into a web page. You don't control the server itself, but they're going to call you, and you don't know how many of them are going to call you, but you want to be able to inject that piece of HTML, uh, when, return that piece of HTML every time they call you, but you also want to be able to know about the user. So as your function is not just HTML, you want to be able to bind behavior and HTML at the same time on a scale that is unprecedented. This is definitely something that's, uh, that's possible with, func with functions. One of the other scenarios that has not been talked here is let's say you're, you have IoT devices. Anybody you doing IoT right now? We'll be bit in the back. All right. How many devices do you have right now? How many devices? Can I get a number? Not at all? All right. So let's say you have a thousand device. And those devices are going to be pinging all the time. But maybe those devices stop calling at 8 o'clock PM. How do you ensure that you pay the least amount of money for responding to those, server, to those requests by your IE2 device. Because you don't want to be able to, you don't want to be turning on and off and off and on your application every time that they're not supposed to be, they're not going to be receiving any answer. And you may receive all those answers, all, all those requests are going to be coming in all at the same times. You want to be able to scale those applications to crazy numbers, but you want also to be able to scale down when, the when those IoT devices go offline. Azure Function is the perfect tool for IoT de development. So let's do a timer trigger, because this is awesome. So same functions that we had a little bit earlier, this time on trusty, trusty Firefox. So we're going to we're going to go into our functions and we're going to create a timer. So let's go here. So directly from our portal, we can just create here a new functions, and we get the same uh, the same experience uh, for all of those scenarios. Here at the top right, I talked about experimental language support. Language that we support are C Sharp, F Sharp, and JavaScript by default. However, if you check that, suddenly it becomes way more interesting. So you know you can do bash directly in functions, or if you're more of a PowerShell kind of people, you can do PowerShell, or you can do Python. Anybody does Python? Same three guys in the room. I don't know. <laughs> Looks like, looks like I should hire you guys. You do everything. Um, we also support PHP and a, and a bunch of other ones. If you think we forgot something, let me know. I will talk to the team. I will make sure that those languages get included. So what we want to do is turn that one off for now. And we're going to do a timer trigger. So I just click on it. And I pick a language. I'm a fan of C Sharp. And here, I can set a schedule. This will run every five minutes. But I don't want to wait five minutes with you guys until, until the end. So let's do, let's run every 15 seconds. This is going to run a lot. So let's do five. I'm a really the patient kind. So this is going to create a file called uh, run.csx. If you're not aware of what CSX is, it's basically C Sharp as a, as a script. This is not compiled. This is going to be recompiled over and over again uh, every time you change it. But the thing is, you can have this nice editor directly in your, in your browser and use it that way. So I can say this timer uh, C Sharp timer trigger function executed at and we're going to run it. 
And we can already see we're way behind. So let's see here and zoom in. So you can see that every five seconds, we're running the functions over and over and over again. This is still free. You may end up paying pennies on it, but this is still free. So this is the basic one that we have. The timer function for me is one of the most important one because if you remember back in the days, or going back in time when you were back on, on, on premise, if you, had a, if you had a job that you wanted to do on a server, you had to install a separate software that would run as a service in Windows and then run that software all on a specific schedule, and it, it would be a mess. And then people would be asking, how do you do that in the cloud? And we came up with web jobs, which I don't even recommend anymore. Because this is running in the same application than your HTTP application, your ASP.NET application, or whatever application you're hosting there, but you're, you're piggybacking off of the applications. Why would you do that? With functions, you can literally just set your timer and say, I want you to run every X minutes or every day. Or with current expression, you can literally say, I want you to run on every Monday of every week. And once you have this timer set up, you can get rid of those web jobs, of those, all those scripts that were mixed with your applications that don't need to be. Now they have their proper home where you can do your own stuff, all your own management scripts for a fraction of the price. And even if your application is not alive or it's been taken down for maintenance, those scripts will still run. They're, they have their own app, app service. They have their own way of staying alive that is not your application. So we already did the, uh, the HTTP applications. So let's do another one. Um, you know what? I'm going to keep this one here. So let's say blob trigger. We're going to go, go C-sharp and say blog trigger C-sharp 1. And I have, already have a path here that is set. It's called file upload. And I'm going to do, let's do a new one. Oh, no, that's good. So this will trigger every time I add a new file. So to my blob trigger. So let's see, integrate. We're going to see the show the value of this. Account name, that is storage. We're good. By the way, don't be afraid. All those keys that you're seeing are all, will all be removed by the end of the show. So, <laughs> so Scott Hunter talked about or Microsoft Azure Storage Explorer. If you remember that, this allows me to navigate all my blob storage. So I don't need to navigate my local ones. I have a few Cosmos DB. And the one I'm interested about is the one that we just built together. And I already have something called here file upload. So the thing I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going I'm to upload a file. So let's say I'm Canadian. I love bacon. Everyone loves bacon, right? I don't have a problem with bacon. It's American bacon, I guess. I don't know. So I just uploaded an, an image. So, and I wasn't there to see it run, right? So let's look at the logs. Oops. What did I do? All right. This will run better on, on, the, on the next demo. So let's not go there. Uh, if you want to have fun with an application, though, um, I have an application called Bacon Not Bacon. That Azure websites that net. Yes, we have an application for that. Um, this is running entirely on Azure Functions. This is not something that requires app service. This is costing me zero money. So I will go back to that bacon because, like I said, nothing wrong with bacon. So let's pick one. We'll say this one here. Oops. So basically, this application is just asking me, is there bacon in this picture? That's the only thing I care about. So I'm going to be doing Summit. And 
as soon as I upload the image and it's analyzed by our server, what we're going to know is whether there is bacon in this picture or not. So there's definitely bacon, but there's no Kevin bacon in that picture. Yeah, it's always a good joke. Uh, so this application right now is costing me zero dollars because the computer vision API that is running behind is mostly free um, because there's 5,000 calls free per month. Then there is um, the Azure Functions, with, which offers a one million invocation for free per month with a ton of memories for also per seconds that allows me to run at crazy numbers. And all of this to satisfy my need for bacon. We like it. Anybody uses Twitter? So I have a boss who code. Hey, I'm here. Look at that. Uh, I have a boss that, that codes. Who has a boss that knows how to code? No? Nobody raises their hand. I had two in the front. Yes. So he built that. So if you're tweeting right now, and include either this Twitter account or the hashtag vision underscore API. We can see his replies here. And it will basically say, this is a close-up of an animal. This is awesome. And this is costing him the same thing. He's using the same functions. He's using it for different purposes. But he's using the same building blocks. And the thing with that app is that if you're you think it's fun, is that you can actually build it yourself. Because if you're going on the main account, you see here, there's a link for Get Started and the source code for the whole Twitter bot. So what, whatever you're using with it, you can actually start from scratch with this sample. So if you want to scan pictures and know what, what is in the picture, we're going to be able to do some more rudimentary version of that. I actually stole a bit of this code, and it's going to be in this demo. It's going to be fun. So, but we talked about .NET Core. So, let's do from current slide. So, let's do a quick run back on what .NET is. So, basically, .NET is a platform to run anything, and it runs pretty much everywhere, from desktop to web application to cloud, mobile, gaming, wherever you, you're looking at, .NET runs right now. And with the advent of .NET Core, we include it even more. Things have gotten fast. Things have gotten better and more compatible. .NET is now a true cross-platform software development experience that you can run pretty much everywhere. If anyone is used to Visual Studio, you know that load time can be a little bit longer to open, to open Visual Studio. What if you want to just change this one file and you have to open the whole Visual Studio things? That might be a bit long. To, this might be long to do. So we, are, we now have Visual Studio Code. And the thing is, Visual Studio Code is actually based off of, based off of elect Electron that is being used to build Atom, which is awesome. We're, we're reusing code. This is all built, built in Node, by the way. But the thing is, .NET Core even has some command line application right now. So you can actually do .NET in the command line, and it works. So it truly works everywhere. And most of my team that is using .NET Core right now don't even have a Windows machine. They're building all of this out of a Mac. And in terms of speed, wouldn't it be interesting for us to use .NET Core since we're doing crazy numbers. Those are the stats, by the way, for uh, round 15 of, um, of .NET. We're talking about 73 million requests per second for a Java servlet, but 2.22 million requests per second for .NET Core. And Node is only 0.53. I don't want to diss Node. Node is awesome. But if you want performance, .NET Core seems to be the place where, it, where it's at. And it's been on an open source journey since forever. S well, almost forever. So 
And it's not just run by Microsoft, it's actually run by a few other companies too. There's a technical steering group members, and all of those are, are here in helping out for .NET to be better. Did you know that Google actually contributes to that? Who didn't know that? Yeah, a lot of raise hand, that's good. All those companies contribute and help out. So I want to put it all together. I think that it, it's time, by the way, for those who don't know, that's the Kubernetes logo. We're not going to be doing containers, but I love that picture. So the thing we're going to do, we're going to start with an empty project. Let's close that out. So I just created a, a small functions uh, right away because I didn't want to bore you with file new project and all of this. And I wanted also to have this computer vision model here that was stolen from my boss. Because he took the time to take this big JSON file and create classes, and everyone knows that this is a boring thing to do. So I stole this code. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add a function. And we're going to create a blob trigger. So let's do new Azure functions. We can call it function one, doesn't matter. And here, we have a list of, of templates. So we're going to pick blob trigger. And again, we're going to be doing file upload with the default connection string. And so basically, this is a single trigger. And it shows that the, file, the name of the file and the size of the blob. And I don't want to have a stream. I want to have a cloud block blob. So this is awesome, but knowing the length of a, blog f uh, of a blob file is, well, underwhelming a little bit. So what I want to do instead, I want to pick this code. This is also code that is stolen from my boss. Everybody heard of copy-paste development? All right, I, I like that. So this is my API key, and I know you're in, I, everything's going to be reset by the end of the, of the session. So I'm just going to be adding a bunch of different libraries here. Just control dot, enter on them so that everything is resolved properly. And of course, uh, you're missing system threading. And here, we can do async. By the way, never do async void. If you do something like that, just do async task. Intent. So the first thing we want to do is we want to await a call to this fetch vision description async, and I'm going to get send it my blob. And this is going to be my result. So what, what did we just do? Let me just collapse this on the right. I just created a function. And this function is, I'm not using the same function that JSON earlier. I'm using C sharp attributes to, to map all of this together. So what I'm saying is, in my blob storage account, in my container file upload, when you have a file of whatever name it is, I want you to send it, when there's a new file, I want you to send it to me as my blob. I don't think the name is, is relevant here. And we're, we could also be using the log to output to the, the same Azure portal. And here, what I'm doing, is basically I'm setting up an HTTP client, adding some keys to it, and I'm going to be mapping myself to Microsoft Cognitive Services, the Vision API that we can see here. And it's going to be the Analyze endpoint. So I'm going to be posting my blob URL to that endpoint, and I'm going to be asking them to analyze it and send me the result. And I will deserialize that result into this uh, Vision description, which is the, the code I stole from my boss. So what do I do with that? Well, I will be taking the same copy-paste development here. And what I want to do is take the same result and take the description out of it, take the captions, the first one, and we're going to output the text. And then we're going to output the confidence. So let's compile this. And we're going to be publishing it. 
So we're going to be, I think we're, we could reuse the same Azure function that we're, we're already, already building. But in case that you, you want to create it, it's no problem to just reuse the same Azure functions or create a new Azure functions directly from Visual Studio. So it's loading my subscriptions. We'll take a second. I'm wondering if the other speakers are uh, downloading the latest bit of Visual Studio at the moment. Uh, all right, so let's do this function here. It's going to pre prepare a profile for me. And from that profile, I'm going to be able to publish my application. And we're going to see output. So here, we're building the application. So if you're not seeing it, let me just zoom in a little bit. So what we're doing is we're creating the function. We're uploading all the DLLs that I'm using for this function, and I'm pushing them directly to Azure. More specifically, I'm pushing them to Azure Functions. And everything has been configured so far. And as soon as it's done, we're going to be able to see that function directly in the portal. So the published file has been, has been done successfully. We've succeeded in deploying our application. So let's go see in the portal if we can have this running right now. Let's do a little refresh. We have function one. It's loading, won't be long. Uh, sorry, this is, that was Chrome. Let's do Firefox. Chrome has something with the, um, with the zoom that is just bad. Let's do functions. And the first thing that will show up with, with function is, is that we're connected now to the streaming service. So if I expand here and I just retake the same file I have here and Let's say I upload this time a nice picture of bacon. Let's see if it, rec it can recognize that it's bacon or not. Um, where's my bacon? Oh, I want bacon. Let's just cancel this and let's go back in my bacon picture. All right, let's do bacon, upload that here. All right. I already uploaded that picture because it was very nice, apparently. And let's do here. This is, by the way, a different uh, service than um, this is a different service than the one I used before for the bacon not bacon. Bacon not bacon was a train model. So let's see if it picks it up. Yeah, it was not finished. So it might, I might have to rerun it again. Let's upload all the bacon. And see if it works. Yeah. Oh man, come on. You can't do it. All right. All right, so I'm guessing it's not showing up. So basically what we're expecting out of this application is once this demo is start running, is I'm running short on time a little bit, but um, we will have a log that's, that would show what is in the picture and the same confidence level than the Vision API that we have here. It's the same stuff. So you would have the same, the same behavior. The only difference is you would not get the uh, maybe or what, what is not. We would just get the descriptions. So the same kind, of, same kind of thing here. We would have a drawing of a face and we would have the tags. And all this computer vision API allows you to get whether this image is uh, suitable for kids or not. So we have detectors on adult stuff or, or whatnot. 
So let's go back to the slides. And so with .NET Core, we're able to, to build serverless applications with compiled code that runs super fast. And we're putting all of this into a model that costs you either zero or pennies on the dollar in a way that removes all the questions about backups, about applications, about servers, about licensing costs, and all of this. And all of this at, for the low cost of zero dollars. Because functions is basically free until your usage becomes too high. .NET is open source, which you can use on any machines, on any kind of free editors from Visual Studio 2015 community editions or even Visual Studio Code. And you can deploy functions from all those scenarios left and right. So my name is Maxime Rouillet. I'm a cloud developer advocate for Microsoft. My Twitter handle and GitHub and email address is there. If you need to reach me out, please feel free to do so. But in the meantime, I would like to thank you very much for this session. But since we're in Spain, gracias. <laughs>